fascinating story in the history of physics about Newton's theory of universal gravitation, which he proposed in his famous book written in 1687, the Principia or Principia, depending on <laughs> your preferred Latin pronunciations. And uh, uh, it, had a, it, w it was a fascinating theory, and it's still our best classical theory of gravitation. We have relativistic theories now and that have in some ways superseded Newton or at least subsumed Newton's ideas into a larger framework. But Newton's idea was that massive bodies exert a force on other massive bodies through empty space. This was the idea of action at a distance. So we have the moon uh, high in the sky above us and its motions are affecting the tides on Earth. But the moon is not touching the Earth. It's not, there's no pushing and pulling. And so how does that happen? Um, Newton famously said, hypothesis non fingo. I don't feign to know the cause. I don't have a full explanation. But I can describe how it happens. I can describe mathematically the strength of that force if I know certain factors, if I know the mass of the moon, the mass of the earth, the distance between them. Um, and he had a famous equation, his, his uh, force law, uh, force of, for calculating the force of gravity. And uh, so he could provide a, a, a very precise mathematical description of the amount of gravitational force in a given situation, but he couldn't tell you what caused the force. Um, and if you think about it, it's, it is actually deeply uh, puzzling, okay? So I just got my, my cell phone here, and if I drop it, it falls to the earth. Now, the, the earth did not touch the cell phone, but somehow there was, you know, and the physicists talked about it in different ways, gravitational attraction or gravitational force, but there, there's a movement produced by something at a distance. So prior to Newton, the scientific ideal in, a, in the period of the, the, the 17th century uh, was advanced by a group of, of thinkers called the mechanical philosophers. This was, and so if you're gonna explain something, they thought you need to have a mechanistic explanation, a, a pushing and pulling. Uh, the early clock. stage positivism sort of. Uh, sorry? Or early stage positivism? In, no? in, in a way, but uh, I mean, we still have this demand for mechanism today. Uh, we, we provide many good mechanistic explanations for things, but it turns out that the four fundamental force laws in physics, not only gravitation, but electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force, all have this, pro this occult property, it was called in the 17th century, of action at a distance. Um, the, 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 the motion is produced in some way by the massive body in the case of gravitation, but we know not how. Uh, we don't, ha we can't, so, um, Leibniz got in wind of, Einz, or, or of Newton's theory and he opposed it and said this is, he accused Newton of bringing occult properties or occult causes into science because there was no mechanical pushing and pulling. And so the two great men ended up having this very spirited correspondence slash debate, Newton writing through an intermediary named Clark uh, and so there's the famous Clark-Leibniz correspondence, but Newton is basically crafting all the responses or putting all the answers and in, 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 giving them all to Clark, and it, it's absolutely fascinating. It ends up in the end underscoring, I think, a great mystery, which, which, which was revealed by a dilemma that Leibniz wanted to impose on Newton to hang him out to dry. And so Le it was actually a trilemma. Leibniz said, well, Either you have a proper scientific pushing and pulling explanation, which you don't have, okay, and you've acknowledged that. So you acknowledge you don't have proper pushing and pulling. So it's not a me mechanistic explanation. So then either you're bringing God into science and saying that somehow the cause of the motions is, is being produced by the, the spirit action of the creator. And, and that was not that implausible because Newton said that gravitational action occurs instantaneously at a distance everywhere and all everywhere throughout the universe, okay? So what causal agent could be responsible for that uniform motion everywhere if it's not material? Because if there's no material pushing and pulling, and this was the dilemma, then, then Leibniz said either you're using one of these 
scholastic um, name game explanation. So famously, Voltaire ridiculed this. Um, you know, the medievals would say that opium puts you to sleep. Why? Because it has a dormitive virtue. It has a sleep-inducing virtue. We still say this today. Aspirin has a pain-relieving formula, and that's the reason it relieves your pain. Uh, so, well, they're not even teleological in that they're just renaming the effect to be explained. Re, they're, they're proposing as a cause a name of the effect, okay? Right. And yeah. that isn't yeah. really at all persuasive. And in the scientific revolution, the, the mechanical philosophers, the early, scientific, the early scientists said, that's a way of thinking that we reject. We want more satisfying explanations. So we want to see an actual explanation. We want to see pushing and pulling. We want to imagine corpuscles of gas causing the expansion of the balloon or, or something of that sort. Okay, yeah, matter and energy. So e either it's a return to one of these scholastic name game explanations, or you're subtly bringing the deity in. So which is it, Newton? Which is what? Which was the the the, the question that, uh, that that Leibniz put to him, and Newton didn't want to fess up to the theistic explanation, which is what he favored. So he said, "Hypothesis non fingo. I don't know the cause." But in private correspondence to a bishop Bentley, who was giving the uh, the the Boyle lectures on natural theology in 1691, um, Newton acknowledges that he thinks that it's that it must be the cause of gravity must be immaterial and um, in examining the corpus of his work one of my my cambridge supervisors said that newton's view was that the explanation of gravity was constant spirit action that that as in the book of hebrews where it says that god sustains the universe by the word of his power and newton has doesn't mention Christ specifically, but he says, in God, all things are held together. He has a close paraphrase of that concept in his theological epilogue to the Principia, the general scolium. And so it's really interesting. The, the, the bottom line in all of that is that scientifically, the fundamental laws of physics that we think of as our ultimate explanatory principles are themselves unexplained. That they involve forces that are occult in the sense that they involve the production of motions under certain circumstances without any materialistic explanation of what is producing those, uh, th those motions. And even with our newer ideas about gravity, with I Einstein's gravity replaces New Newton's notion of gravity, or, or at least subsumes Newton and then provides a broader context, but he, he proposes that gravity is the result of the curvature of space. So how does the curvature of an empty object, of an empty something, produce motion in material things. It's, it's equally occult and mysterious. And, now, and then su subsequent to that, we have the idea of gravitons, which are massless particles that aren't even pushers. They're attractors. So how does a massless particle pull or attract? It's all quite mysterious. We can describe mathematically beautifully. We have mathematical principles that seem to describe the universe's, the, the, the phenomena of the universe, but we do not have materialistic explanations uh, uh, for these fundamental forces.